Hello and welcome to the Automotive Anecdotes podcast from Automotive Tales, your regular chat about all things on four wheels that your other friends just don't want you to talk about. You're of course joined by your regular hosts, John at John MSM on all social media platforms, and I am Martin Clayton uh, at Bob Clayton ninety two. As I found out through this podcast at Twitter, please do not visit at Bob Clayton on Twitter. I had that ten years ago. I don't know how to delete it. Uh, <laughs> we- <laughs> I'm going to tag that in everything now. (laughs) We are, of course, joined by our regular guests for this series. Uh, Chris Norton, so uh, at underscore Chris Norton underscore on Instagram. And Greg Coles, and I'm the Yorkshire CNG on Twitter. And I haven't really got around to the other social media channels, even though we're now up to episode five. And yet you've had a whole lockdown, Greg. But I'm in the same boat uh, and I know you are an essential worker, whereas uh, some of us have had too much time on our hands and I still haven't got round to creating uh, a Tumblr, a Bebo or a MySpace. John, you may have noticed that uh, we are not in the same room um, and that is because we are in lockdown too. As you can probably tell from this brilliantly edited version of the podcast that you've just spent the last week editing, John. Uh, how do you feel being locked down in lockdown two? Bored out of my skull, uh, and also frustrated because there's so many things we want to be doing, um, so many videos we want to be making that we just can't at the moment, which is frustrating. Absolutely, but never mind. It's especially when there are uh, new vehicles to the Automotive Tales fleet sitting in the yard that uh, haven't had just... their relevant airtime. Unvideoed. I know it's it's massively frustrating. But hey ho, John. It also means that uh, you have the script. So perhaps at this moment in time, I can hand over to you and tell the listeners what we're going to talk about today. So um, we we have a two parter today, not the normal three parter, uh, because we're going to start with uh, an introduction to what sort of car balls we are. So we've heard about what's your worst, your best, your most expensive, your the one you most regret selling. Today we're going to ask, what's the worst car uh, as you were growing up? So be it your parents' car or a sibling's car or your aunt and uncle's car or your grandparents' car. What really stands out as that terrible car uh, and why is it so terrible? Then we're going to move on to our normal round discussions where we're going to try and take it a bit more topical. So we're going to start to look at what are your favourite new cars on the market. Uh, And in typical style, I have a list. So on our list, it's broken down into five categories. You can see I've torn it out of my notebook and made a right mess. Um, So it's going to be favourite new car in the super mini category or city car, whatever you used to call it. Uh, in family slash SUV slash estate car because we know these days uh, a family car is really an SUV when an estate car is perfectly good for the job so they're all in the same category there now and then the third one 4x4 slash utility vehicle so an actual off-roader rather than an SUV Uh, the fourth one is sports car and finally uh, battery electric vehicle slash hybrid so that kind of more sustainable part of the market which one is our favourite and why and then instead of Marge Bingo, uh, hopefully the votes will be in and we can actually announce who the winner of Marge Bingo is this time. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to seeing who the winner of this massive fix that is Marge <laughs> Bingo uh, is. The idea that someone who entered a jet engine might win this whole thing. Uh, I'm not going to lie, I'm probably going to put in a formal complaint. Are you suggesting voter fraud, Martin? Look, we all know that it was rigged from the beginning... I don't care. I am going to win. Whoever, if anybody else wins, it's you know, it's fake. It's all fake news. I will sue Mike, you. I'm going to win. Why don't you kick off then with the whole? Uh, th- this was very much your your suggestion in terms of a category to talk about worst cars growing up. You want to fire off with that one? Can I throw a very small grinding gear in here, just slightly off topic, sixty second <laughs> burst? Yeah. Harking back to episode one. Harking back to episode one. <laughs> People, it's winter. There's fog. It gets dark early. Turn your lights on. Done. <laughs> very topical. I like it. It's very good. 
or if you're listening to this in the summer, uh, people, it's summer. Turn your fog lights off. Just cover all bases. Cover all bases. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, worst car as you were growing up. Um, now we kind of talked about this a little bit in the past. Um, and me and Greg used to do a lot of things together as we were growing up. Um, so he was uh, was there around the various collections of cars that my parents had, specifically my mother. Uh, and I know he has his own uh, worst car from the collection of cars my mother had, uh, which is probably, I'm going to guess, uh, a third-gen Fiat Punto, or Grande Punto, as they're called. Am I right? Oh, yes. And the miles I did to bring that back from uh, the south of France and up the mm-hmm. country, and yeah... So I was tortured. That was, that was going to be my choice for this um, because it really was a terrible car. It arrived brand new with squeaks and rattles. It went back two or three times before they eventually figured out that the heat shield wasn't bolted on properly. Uh, the rattling behind the dashboard turned out to be one of the three bolts missing from the passenger side door that had been left at some point, I'm assuming, on a Friday afternoon behind the dashboard. And then when they came back to it on Monday morning, they just screwed the dashboard over the top and didn't bother finding where the missing screws were. Uh, the first time my brother got in the passenger seat, he put his hand on the uh, the hand grip at the top of the door, and that came straight off. Um, and I did the usual thing. Well, I quite like the centre console. Ran my hand over the centre console, only for it to be sliced open by a piece of plastic sticking out between where the radio had been pushed in and the rest of the dashboard. Um, this is really sharp edge just left there, uh, which was lovely. Um, but interesting enough, this isn't the worst car, despite all of its failings. Because once I discovered you have to drive it like an Italian, I actually quite liked it. You basically wring its neck everywhere you go. It was actually quite good fun. Um, so Really? Uh, oh, really? Oh, oh. Yeah, genuinely. Mm. Oh, for the honour of uh, the worst car from my growing up was uh, the car that replaced the Fiat. So it went from bad to worse. Um, was what might sound odd to people, a second gen uh, facelift Skoda Octavia estate. Sounds like a wonderful car, right? Except when it's the 101 horsepower 1.6 MPI. So just think about it. You've got you've got a what 13, 1400 kilo estate car uh, with a hundred horsepower, 77 horsepower. I did the calculations because it annoyed me so much. 77 horsepower per ton is literally hopeless. Bearing in mind, not long after that, I bought a brand new Citroen C1 that had 84 brake horsepower per ton. So it was more gutless than a C1, and I had to take it out to Austria, loaded to the hilt with stuff, uh, and it first gear was basically the only useful gear on anything other than the dead flat. It was terrible. I absolutely hated it. And the reason it's it's the worst is not because the car was bad. I loved the Octavia. That was great. It was because it was so spoilt by that engine. The fact they bothered to fit anything so gutless and wheezy, um, it just... It just ruins a perfectly good car. So, Skoda, Vag Group, what were you thinking? It's stupid. What was the brake um, horsepower per ton? Yeah. Uh, 77 horsepower per ton, I think it worked out. Yeah, I must admit, there's definitely um, cars in that range which come under the classification of dangerously underpowered. And when you're trying to make your way onto a slip road and, and uh, match the speed of a motorway... Um, it can be quite tricky. Yeah, I don't think the power was necessarily the problem. It's just when you actually looked at the torque figure, because the diesel, mm. 1.6 TDI, had 104 brake horsepower, so it was only three more, but it at least had some usable torque, so it could actually shift its arse along the road. Yeah. Yep. That car, for the purpose it was bought for, which was trundling backwards and forwards to Austria, should have been a 1.9 or a 2 litre TDI. It would have been the perfect car had that been the case. Do you not think that um, engines like that are sort of anomalies in um, manufacturers' ranges where they they just think, right, we're going to flog them as pull cars to, you know, and when they say the new Skoda Octavia from 16995. That's your sixteen nine nine five, or probably back then it was nine 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 five. It was probably their ten grand car at the time. So, interestingly, uh, yes, I have a few thoughts on that. When I was doing the research, I discovered they actually did a one point four MPI for um, I think it was in somewhere out in the, in Eastern Europe, Poland or somewhere, as a uh, like a pool car for police use. 
which must have been utterly horrendous. And that had, that had I think, it was 98 <laughs> horsepower. Why? But you're right. It was one of those cars that I think the dealer had been forced to take by, I guess, the central Skoda UK uh, as a demonstrator or a, we just don't know what the hell to do with this car because it was, uh, you know, appliance gloss white. Um, and my mum went in to look at the States, looking at getting potentially a Fabio or something that sort of size. So she went to the Skoda dealership. They saw her coming and sold her the one car they realised they couldn't shift to anybody else and managed to make it sound like a great deal. So I, I see your 1.6 and I raise you the fact that you could buy the Skoda Octavia in 2008 with the 1.4 16-valve petrol engine only in classic specification. Um, this had a whopping... 80 brake horsepower. Beep. It did not... Why would somebody buy that? Not to 60 in 14.2 seconds <laughs> and tops Head out at a biblical 107 miles an hour. Good yes. Lord. Proof that people will buy anything, apparently. Well, yeah, absolutely. The person that's selling it, uh, selling because I've purchased a seven-seater. So that means he probably loaded this up. That's brave. Yeah. Wow. You okay. struggle yeah. to drive that into a stiff breeze without it uh, it coming to a grinding halt. Mad, mad. <laughs> but uh, do you reckon this was just a historical thing from Skoda being cheap Volkswagens, so they just got the NAF engines in the range? Maybe. But they've been building the brand up for quite a while. No, but they were still sharing the engines, weren't they? I don't think the one the the new one point four turbos had arrived at that point. Uh, for VAG full stop, so you could get that 1.6 engine in the Golf until I think about 2008, 2010. Same with the 1.4 in the Golf, so it, it, it was around the whole VAG group for quite a long time. In fact, the Leons full had it in as well, 1.6. Yeah, it's interesting though, isn't it? Because you know, none of us were bat an eyelid at the idea. So my my parents, for example, and I, I, this isn't a, a contributor to bad cars, so. Uh, my parents at the moment have an Astra, which actually I really like because it's um, it's a nice little modern car. But that's got a 1.6 turbo, um, the petrol that's 200 brake. So it's really interesting to see where cars have gone because that will do 0 to 60 in 6.6, um, and a top speed of 151 in an Astra, and it's not even a sporty one, you know. Mm. Basically, what what the Skoda was missing was a small snail shaped component to make it go a little bit faster. Ah, but then then you'd have had a VRS. Well, indeed. But not with a 1.6, you wouldn't. No. No, it'd be 1.8 turbo at that point. So, yeah, that's my offering. Who's uh, who's who's up next? Go on, then. I'll go. <laughs> Don't all um, volunteer at once. Yeah. So, my parents' worst car um, is... I, th I think I might have covered this in a previous one, but what I consider to be their worst car was probably on paper their best car and what I consider their um, best car was on paper the very worst car that they had so um, although my dad had a Skoda Rapid when I was younger which was a truly awful awful car um, I actually really liked it but um, one of apart from a kind of brace of various different Peugeot hatchbacks and estates which just uh, are not even uh, don't even inspire enough emotion to actually say that they were the worst or actually very hated they were just <laughs> I have no feelings about them at all um, the, the worst car that they had um, was actually a BMW 1 series when they first brought those out um, and they got one in I think it was 2005 which was the the kind of very first, um, or one of the very first to roll off the um, production line, I believe. Um, and on paper, it was a really great car. Um, it was a it was a really nice car, but there were so many things with it, which would have you know, if if I actually owned it, would have done my head in. Um, first of all, it had run flat tires, uh, which became very popular then um, and I don't know what size is alloys 18 inch alloys and run flat tires um, 
And that, coupled with, I think it had a sports suspension package or something like that, it was it was basically um, like driving in a car without any suspension. It was so rough and harsh. It was it was it, the ride was atrocious in it. Um, and and not only that, um, my mum did actually end up getting a puncture at one point. Um, and took it back to the BMW dealer who said, ah, yes, of course. Um, and as, as I'm, I'm sure most of the, the listeners know, once you've driven on a run flat tyre, you have to replace it, um, you know, all of it. Uh, and uh, Not, yeah, not just was, the air in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Um, and I think they were charging at the time £220 per tyre, um, which was, yeah, uh, a bit hard to swallow. Um so there was that. The 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 room in the rear was terrible, um, especially for me who uh, I had already started shooting up at that point. Uh, didn't have very much room. You you struggled really to get three people in the back there, um, and yeah, it was it was generally just a bit <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> Don't mince your words. Yeah, <laughs> it kind of was. Um, on paper, great, you know, great car, decent engine. Um, you know, pe- people were quite divided on the looks of them. I, I don't mm. mind the looks too much. Um, uh, at the time, they were they were very marmite, but yeah. I think they they've probably aged quite well. I'd say I, I don't think they look, um, you know, out of place today. Well, compared to uh, BMW's latest offering, anything with a bangle design is positively mm. wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. All of a sudden, they've they've grown in everybody's estimations. As you say, they were a bit marmite. Now they're just like, well, I mean, BMW used to make bangle design cars, and they were lovely. Yeah. This new tripe they're rolling out is um, <laughs> it's much worse. Not, yeah. not a fan, John. Not a fan. Yeah. Had you gathered? At the risk of uh, at the risk of being controversial, uh, I dislike the one series uh, now. Um, yeah, I, I dislike all one series, uh, but the, I think Mark One was actually the best looking one series. Um, mm. In the it, and I, it has aged really well, but even back then, you had to have it with the M Sport pack to make yeah. it look look decent. And I, I worked for a car supermarket. Um, who can still be found online, the UK's leading car supermarket, um, at the time when they were all coming to about sort of, uh, you, 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 could, you could pick up um, anywhere between sort of three and six year old models. And the only way we'd ever bring them in as part X with any money on them is if they were M Sport. Mm-hmm. If it didn't have an M Sport pack, they were cheap as chips. Um, but, but they lost this reputation by, didn't they have a dodgy two litre diesel unit in some of them? Um, that really sort of knocks its reputation in ter- about the turn of the millennium as well, from what I remember. Chris, I think for the listeners, it's probably fair that we um, just clarify here. How tall would you have been at the point that you were being told you had to sit in the back of a one series? Ooh, uh, on on family trips, uh, I would have been about uh, yeah, probably about fifteen, sixteen, and I was. Probably approaching six foot four or five at that age, I'd say. Um, okay, I thought so, you were about to say six foot and end there, and I was going to go. That's fine. Sort of the average height of a male, yeah. probably. Um, but yeah. I think it, it, this was all to do with the fact that they put rear wheel drive in a small hatchback, presumably. Yeah, and and they had the kind of uh, the the roof line sort of tapered in quite heavily towards the back of the car. Um, and they also did this kind of weird thing where they they put sort of diagonal bolsters either side of the the rear seat. So all of the rear passengers was kind of forced in closer together than the, what they should have been. Yeah, it made it into a two plus two. They did the same on the three series. Mm. Um, I remember once being collected from the airport in a three series, reasonable amount of space. Uh, you know, BMW estate should be fine. And to get three people in the back was a real a real squeeze because the person in the middle is sat like this with you know their shoulders up by their ears yeah and either either people on the door have got plenty of space between them and the door because the bolsters slide you into the middle of the car yeah it was yeah. a stupid design of that 
Yeah, no idea why they did that, but uh, yeah, yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, that was the one that brought me the most hatred. It was a great car on paper, but the the practicalities of it um, just made any journey a misery, really. It's fair. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, who wants to go next? Greg, Martin? Go on, Greg. Okay. Uh, it was an interesting one, this, because initially I sort of turned to some of my dad's company vehicles, but they were vans, and I didn't think they really sort of counted in the mix, uh, to be brutally honest. I'd agree with that. Uh, I think the one car in the family uh, that I didn't really get was one of my brother's cars. He had a... Vauxhall Vectra uh, from probably the turn of the early, I think it was early 2000s. I think it was about Y Reg actually, 51 plate or something like that. But it was, uh, I think it was 150 brake horsepower. It was supposed to be like an SRI type version from that era. And for some weird reason, it was a saloon, 150 brake very heavy Vectra, didn't handle, just was not comfortable whatsoever. And I think it's that generation where Vauxhall just sort of lost the way a little bit. Uh, you know, on paper, it was probably very good as a Retmobile in diesel form, hatchback or estate. But uh, I have to say of all the cars, bear in mind my older brothers had an original Saxo uh, VTS. He then had that with a, a Mark I Focus RS, then had the Vectra after that you know in fact i had the vectra before the focus uh i then finished it off with an r going from the vectra to the focus it is fine but had it been the other way around as you were just suggesting that that would have been it painful. could be it could be it, it could be disastrous i have no idea i have a sneaky feeling it was his first wife who he probably divorced that probably caused that one but <laughs> <laughs> we won't go through that in there <laughs> But I have to admit, it just wasn't a practical car. It was really uncomfortable. It was really unreliable. And it just wasn't Vauxhall's finest hour, to be honest. It was as simple as that. And, I, and at the time, I was comparing it against cars my mum's had. You know, she's had a really old school Fiesta, four-speed manual, uh, the Volvo 340, the Volvo 440, uh, stuff like cars. that uh, over the years. Uh, even down to, you know, my mum's little Fabia now just outstripped the Vectra all day long and that's got 60 horsepower the best of days uh, but at least it's comfortable at least it does the job and you know what you're getting the Vectra just failed to do distance failed to be reliable failed to take any kit failed to take people and it just wasn't quick either because it was so heavy even for 150 brake horsepower it had SRI but it wasn't an SRI of what Vauxhall have been known in the past uh, to be able to produce I mean I think it's fair to say that SRI um, and as we'll know from previous episodes, I am currently an owner of an SRI. Um, these days doesn't, and it's probably since the, the millennium really, hasn't meant uh, performance. It's meant they, they have better looking alloys and, you know, deeper sills. Uh, it's a trim level. Yeah, it's a bit like um, what Ford have done with this whole ST line, you know, uh, mm. where they where you have sort of uh, or, well M Sport. It's an M Sport. You know, think about all the vehicles that have M attached to them, but it's um, mm. you know that aren't you know M Sport packs. But I think a two liter diesel motorsport edition, yes, yeah. because a two liter diesel is your perfect motorsport engine. Exactly, but I do feel for Vauxhall at the time because Vauxhall. Um, you know, they, they they just weren't. When you think about that model that came out in ninety five, ninety six, and then it had a facelift, and uh, and then ran until two thousand two. But at the same time, you had Ford that had just completely nailed the Focus and then transposed that all over to the Mondeo. And we've already spoken about them. The fact that Volkswagen thought, hang on a minute, we can bring out a you know a a, a Golf a, 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 a Golf rival that's actually bigger than a Golf and verging on Vectra size with the Octavia for less money. Um, so everyone else just upped their game. There were still some, you know, it's a weird time for hatchbacks because they were popular, but there were still some rubbish ones. It was the case, because the problem is, bearing in mind at that point, we'd, we'd not long had the Astra, Astra uh, SRI, the Carlton SRI, uh, the Nova, which then SRI to the back end of its generation. I've had, you know, it was only five, ten years previous that Vauxhall had really nailed some quite good models yeah. and done really well. You know, you'd think off the back of something like the Carlton 
and even the Omega, which I wouldn't say was a particularly good car, but it was quick and big and comfortable for its time, back in the 90s, you know, the big 2.2 16 valve engine they had to them. You know, they were the car of choice for Britain's police forces. You know, they were big, they were comfortable, they were quick. Uh, and then they just completely okay. lost the plot. Shame. Okay, so uh, we'll take that. So a Vectra SRI that isn't really an SRI in anything other than badge engineering. So Martin, what about you? Well, there's a reason that I wanted to go last, and it's purely because in this instance, I don't think I've actually got much to compete. Um, so mine will be relatively short because I think about what my family have had, and I have to take my brother out of the equation straight away because um, pretty much all of his cars I've either found for him or given to him. So, so, so if you said they're rubbish, it's entirely your fault. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I've given him such beautiful cars as the Rover 45, the Rover 25, uh, the Renault Laguna, um, you know, a fleet of absolutely brilliant cars that for some reason... You... Just you broken. really hate your brother, don't you? Yeah, we don't we don't get on very well. No, it's a, and at the moment he has a he just has a diesel Fiesta, which is is fine. It is an car. So I have to look back at sort of my um, you know if we're talking about cars that I grew up with. Even my gran had some interesting cars. Um, he you know she had uh, the, we've spoken in, in previous episodes about the Citroen BX with the you know with the with the the, the, the up cool. and down suspension. Um, yeah. And then she she literally had that. She had, uh, and then Rovers. Um, and you know what? For a little old lady that needed an automatic car, she had one of those Rover 216s that was actually a Honda um, back in the 90s. Honda engine, Honda gearbox, Honda interior. It was absolutely fine and ran for 10 years, and then she bought a 45, and we don't talk about that. Uh, so I have to look at my parents and just say that, actually, my, my, my mum was just, they, they had boring cars. Uh, so the worst car they ever had was probably a Nissan Almira, um, and she had two. She loved her Mark One Almira so much. She went. She was the one person that went to a showroom and went, "I need you to produce a new model of these." Um, and it was a one point five <laughs> petrol, chain driven engine, low maintenance, never broke down, but just had zero things going for it. I guess for some people though the perfect definition of a car is something that is bland you don't want character you don't want you know quirks and foibles you just want something you're going to get in turn the key and it you almost forget going from A to B because it's it's funny you da- say that da- da- Dacia Duster for example or the Sandero yeah, yeah, just it, basic A to B transport th- this was it my you know my mum would say to me at the time because we'd complain you know in, in fairness there wasn't much competition my, my stepdad at the time had a fleet of Mondeos, and they were just the same thing. You know, diesel car, A to B, but actually were a bit more entertaining. Um, And he had some gear models that, you know, had some features on them. Whereas my mum said, I'm a maths teacher at a secondary school. I want a car that I know I can park in the car park. No one will remember it's there, and I can come back in the afternoon at a thousand... Even her. Yeah, a thousand kids have walked (laughs) past it, and none of them have batted an eyelid you know marked it damaged it and i can turn the key and i can listen to simon mayo and you know drive time get home and forget it's there until the next day when i go out and realize that i've got a way of getting to work to do exactly the same again and not use it on the weekend yeah okay so i think we i think that segment has come to its uh, its natural conclusion so i think we should eagerly move on to favorite new cars so I think we'll go through by segment. So favorite new car in the super mini slash city car uh, segment of the market. So Greg, go. Uh, I think it's prob- <laughs> probably if I was being practical. Um, well, it's not practical really. I quite like the look of the new Toyota Yaris, the GR Sport, uh, the thing they've brought out. The I can't remember how many horsepowers. I haven't had a chance to really talk, but... Uh, the Gazoo Racing Yaris. The Gazoo Racing Yaris. And it just looks mad. And it's that sort of thing that every now and then I like to see coming out of the Japanese car market. It's just something where they've gone, you know what? Sod it. We're going to throw our technical expertise at it. And we're just going to throw out a bit of a monster. Uh, and I, I'm really quite quite interested in that. My question to the group, does that count as a city car? Because 
it's technically a homologation because it's just a limited production run. Do you know Feather Sector's really missing some cool, good super... I guess the problem is they're probably going a bit too extreme, aren't they, really? I guess the Gazoo is probably a bit too powerful. That is not just give it a, a big engine and make it go a bit quicker. That is... I mean, it's got... Uh, a different roof line a lot of the chassis has been built differently they've got integrated carbon fiber panels that are bonded on rather than normal steel um you know spot welded chassis uh it's got wide arches it's got a whole different drive chain in it. it's four-wheel drive it's, it's not really a yaris is it anymore <laughs> i think if i went out and had to look at something interesting that i'd maybe consider looking at is then probably the new fiesta i think it looks quite smart in the right color and it's pretty well kitted yeah, it's a lot cheaper than VAG and the options. It comes with some really good engines and it comes with some good levels of kit. There's a one of the guys at work's got one and you know what? It's a nice piece of kit. And a uh, a great manual gearbox, if I don't say my, so myself. <laughs> <laughs> and why, why would you say that then, Chris? Uh, absolutely no reason. <laughs> okay, well, uh, as you've uh, stuck your head above the parapet, Chris, have you got any thoughts on the Super Mini category? Uh, yeah, um, so I think... Um, I've I've taken the uh, super mini phrase to heart, and and for me, um, what I'd selected is the VW Up. Um, I I think they are great little cars. Um, you know they're they're reasonably priced. They're good quality. They're they're small city cars, um, but they've also managed to maintain something that is quite cool, and and you know nice nicely proportioned quite a nice car to look at um so yeah i think for me the the vw up is the um you know if i were looking for a small city car and it's kind of true guys have ever run about to go to the shops and back uh you know to to go to work you know if i worked in a in a city that sort of thing to just nip about in i think uh i think that would be a great choice can I can I change my choice? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but are you are you changing your choice, Greg? Because you want the electric version of it? Because you're a Yorkshireman like me. I'm changing my choice because if I'm going to throw in a category for super mini, not just small car, I'd seriously also consider the Kia Picanto GT Line S with the little sports kit on the red piping. Because now they do the one liter turbo engine. That's a little bit of a pocket rocket with a seven year warranty and stacks of kit on it. So. <laughs> I don't think Martin's a fan somehow. I uh I once again harking back to the motor trade days, uh I took some picantos in as part X and it oh, no. it has a clutch that is either on or off. Uh and the I, new one though, the new one Martin, not the old one. Well, either way, uh um yeah. Um, not back in your car supermarket days. <laughs> <laughs> I I've just Googled it because I was kind of unaware of it, but yeah, not too bad actually. So, I interestingly, I want to interject here because my choice um, before this was initially um, a very brash choice of uh, I, I think all city cars are a waste of time and therefore would go for a cheap one. And therefore, in my head, my, I was like, right, okay, someone's going to say Volkswagen up, so I'll be clever here and say Skoda City Go, uh, because it's the same car but cheaper. Except, I've since discovered that you can't buy a brand new, you can't buy a brand new City Go or say at me, because they're going to reintroduce them both as electric only. So you can only buy the Volkswagen up as a brand I've just double checked on Auto Trader if you put brand new into Auto Trader the only one you can buy for 12,900 pounds are the Volkswagen up um yes but we all want a Yorkshire up don't we yeah we all e want an e up e up, e -up. E -up. But, but it still comes down to the idea that someone's going to walk into a showroom and go I want a car that no one else can fit in and here's 12 and a half grand no, I don't. I want to go and buy a second-hand something else. Therefore, my actual answer to this round, John, is pass. I'll take the money. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, with the Yaris being off the table, I have gone for the Mazda 2. Uh, only because I drove a Mazda 2 and a Mazda 3, I think, uh, when we were looking for a new car a few years ago. And actually quite a nice little car. And at the, what, the 15 grand... Um, 
up to the rugby back end. The rugby back end. They do, yeah. If you look at it from the front quarter, it's a lot better looking than the rear quarter, to be honest. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and you can spend up to twenty one thousand pounds on a Mazda two, which seems like an Ooh. awful lot of money. Um, but at an entry level at sort of fifteen, I thought, yeah, it's not a bad little little piece of kit. Mid range, it's sort of seventeen and a half for a ninety PS Sport Now Plus. Uh, a cool little car, and having driven one, they have the proper MX Five feel to the gear change. Uh, literally, the definition of a snickety gearbox. They're uh, sorry, Chris. I know you're a big fan of the Fiesta's gearbox, <laughs> um, but um, the, the the boys at Mazda did something right. Um, so yeah, so uh, I'm going to quickly move on then to family cars. Um, so as I as I said in the preamble, I kind of take SUVs or estates depending on what your take on a family car is. Um, so Martin, you look like you uh, you've got your hand in the air; it's flickering in and out of screen. But go for it. You clearly yep. want to say something because there's only one option, uh, and it is the Skoda Superb Estate. And that, that, what else do you need to say? It's uh, I mean, it's an excellent choice. Uh, especially if you get it with the uh, with uh, the 280 brake four wheel drive DSG uh, two liter model, what, you know, it's. Uh, I just think it's all the all the car you need and probably more because you'll never fill the boot. Uh, it's not a silly four by four for the road, um, so you know it's just the best of both worlds. And I am not biased in any way, shape, or form. Okay. That was a very decisive answer. Who wants to who wants to jump in next, Chris? Uh, come back to me. I'm still I'm still deciding. <laughs> because you know that the right answer has already been picked. Uh, I think you made a very persuasive argument. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's tough yep. to uh, disagree with that. Okay, Greg, go on then. I, I'm going to be I'm going to throw a challenge in there to Martin a little bit because I did look at the the superb and I agree with him for all the reasons of the 280 the four-wheel drive, and all the car you need. The only the only other thing I've thrown in there, I would throw in there is I've got a colleague at work who's got a Kodiak, Skoda Kodiak, and having watched the getting the kit... Is that like, is that like one of those camera things? Kodiak, not Kodak. It, and you know what? It, it, in terms of being able to get all the kit in, lots of space, well thought out, you know, that simply clever Skoda... And getting the kids in at you know that 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 level rather than having to bend down to get into the estate and having helped him lift his kid's child seat into the car, I can sort of see why that works for a family if you've got young kids. I think if you've got older kids, then the superb all day long. But particularly with the younger kids, I, I really hate to admit it because I hate the whole SUV culture. I think it's a waste of materials. I think it's a waste of fuel, and it's a harm to the environment amongst many other things. But at the moment, if I was looking at it with two small children, yeah, I'd probably look at the Kodiak in five-seater form. Can, oh, 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 right. That last bit of the end was... I was about to say, can we make a compromise and say that it's fine if you opt for the seven-seat model because there's something there that Superb can't do? <laughs> well, the thing is, you can do that. You can have to... I think his is actually the seven, but he has the seats down all the time. Yeah. So he has always got the option to pick school friends and kids up and... Knowing what my my uh, uh, what my sister in law's like, where she's picking Olivia and Paige and Paige's friend up, and they're doing dance class for family. Going by the title of the category, John's picked family car. It works, but then again, she doesn't have a Kodiak. She actually has a Renault, sorry, a Citroen Picasso, which is seven seats, two fold down, and again, it's that category of car that just does really well and practical. The um, the I suppose the. I go back to because I I, I I actually really like the Kodiak as well, um, and I think it looks. I do think it looks good. I think it's one of the better looking SUVs. Um, I personally don't need it, so I wouldn't have it. But I, I I put I put a counter argument to you that um, unlike the Superb, the Kodiak has a sibling uh, that's two thousand pounds cheaper, which is the same. Yes, I was going to say the si- say at Taraco. So. You know, it, it, I suppose that whole if you were going to buy, uh, if if we were saying S, family SUV, then you'd absolutely, absolutely those those sort of series of cars would absolutely have my vote. Um, I think we're reasonably on the same page there because you know. Yeah, I think I think 
I think if the kids are grown up and they're a bit older and you don't have to bend down and put car seats in and friends and that, then yeah, I'd probably like to say go the the way of the estate. The other thing that I think uh, now I just have a look at it um, to that, that actually works, uh, you know, for that as well is if you um, compare a Skoda Kodiak, uh, brand new from a Skoda dealer, um, one point five auto, so the petrol turbo petrol. Uh, a Skoda Kodiak is £26,000, okay? How much do you think the exact same estate uh, Skoda Superb is in comparison? Oh, it's going to be into the 30s, surely. Yeah, £32,990. So it's actually six grand cheaper to buy the Kodiak. Maybe that's just because they're more popular, I don't know, but... How can you argue against that? That's, you know? I, I think now, that's a really interesting point, given the options. It's quality. It's quality. I said the Superb is a plusher ride. It's quieter. It's more comfortable. But if you've got the kids and 2.4 children clambering around, screaming, shouting, sticking sticky fingers everywhere, it's probably not your priority. Not annoyingly, that means that uh, my final answer that was definitely the right answer is actually the wrong answer. Well, it's the right answer for you. That's the interesting thing. Oh, I'm changing but... my vote. Greg wins. okay so i might as well uh interject here um uh because it'll be interesting to put this in before uh john has his 2p but um so that predictable uh, well yeah yeah, john so so my my choice uh would have to be a, a volvo v90 um or, you know, alternatively a V60, uh, dependent on uh, what you're trying to do with it. But, um, yeah, I, I think they're fantastic cars. Uh, I drove an S90 when they first came out. Um, and it was it was quite a step change for Volvo um, from from the last couple of years or so. Um, you know, and, and they since updated the whole of their range and used that same design language same interior um and i i think it's it's really nice uh they're they're nice comfortable cars um and being a volvo uh you know you can depend on it as well how did how did you find it though to drive because it's just Mm. how big the v90 is it's very big when you actually when you go to town try and park it in anything other than the, the supermarket with the biggest parking spaces it's a big bit of kit and it's long yeah it's a proper plus size Volvo, like they always used to make, like the old nine sixties. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's also very expensive. There is <laughs> there is no denying that it's a great car, but oh yeah, they start at about well, the RRP starts for for a V ninety petrol uh, estate at forty nine thousand pounds. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay, so that that interestingly brings me on to my choice, which was. Uh, predictably a Volvo V60. Uh, there's a reason we bought one. Do you own one, John? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a reason we bought one. It's a lovely looking machine. Uh, and it is, it, it does everything we want. And it is a great family car. We we replaced an XC90 with the V60, albeit it was a much older XC90. But when I got the XC90, that was a... John? Go on. How would you feel, though, sticking two kids in there, particularly with all that shiny plastic plastic that you already moan about so yeah and the you, leather seats you kind, of, uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head essentially the, the older xc90 was a, a much more agricultural vehicle and it well we, that's essentially how we used it we threw you know bales of hay and uh trailers on the back and marquees in it and you name it and it got absolutely abused and it took everything um that we could throw at it there are many things that that we did with it we wouldn't necessarily do with the v60 because it, you know, it's not it's not four by four it's not for off-roading it's not for using on a farm um but as a as a car for what we mainly use so we replaced the xc90 and the v40 with the v60 it is capable of towing it has got a decent sized boot um and it's relatively efficient which the xc90 wasn't particularly so from that perspective for us it's the perfect family car albeit we are a family of two we don't have kids and if we had dogs then it, it would equally still be a very suitable car Whereas the XC90 was a seven-seater, and we did lend it to to a friend of ours, Graham, in the village to tow his caravan for a kid's holiday. And he put wife, two kids, plus I think probably kids' friends, because they had all seven seats up. And they could still put luggage in, and they could tow the caravan. 
So from that point of view, it's actually a perfect family car to have a big SUV. So I do kind of get that. But my choice is still going to be, for for what I need in the family, the V60 is the perfect so, car. So your choice is, is your favourite large car? Uh, yeah, I think so. But not... I, I think I think what Greg's going for here is that, and I agree with Greg here, is that bearing in mind that having once again done my check, the cheapest brand new petrol V60 is £35,700. Um, you've now got to spend ten grand more than a Kodiak and then be annoyed when the plastics get scrapped. There's an assumption you're paying thirty-six grand for that V60. We bought a brand new V60 and we did not pay 36000 for it. But John, interestingly, going back to your analogy there with your friend Graham with a family mm. and seven seats, you then marry that straight back in parallel to Kodiak with seven seats if yeah. you put them up and I think you're probably right. Go away and you and you could get it in four wheel drive with a two litre diesel. It's a very good diesel. It gets a very good DSG box if you want it. And it will do it's got quite a good towing weight if you want it. I think it's got quite a good tow weight. The equivalent of that would be the X C sixty. However, we did actually look mm. at the X C sixty as an alternative. Um and actually, it's significantly more expensive than the Kodiak and other equivalents. How did the XC60 go for, uh, I don't know, say, family members that may have had one before you? Uh, how did that work for them? There is that. Yeah, I mean, the the in-laws did have one of the very first of the XC60, the current sort of facelift, uh, with the Thor's hammer headlights of the newest shape V60, uh, sorry, XC60s. And it didn't necessarily go that well. For Not all of it was the car's fault. Um, the fact that they run on, you know, super low profile tyres, as all these fancy SUVs do now, uh, it only took one pothole to actually crack the rim, uh, which wasn't good. Uh, they got a stone chip, which cracked the windscreen all within about three months of buying it. Uh, but they did also have some uh, manufacturer issues along the lines of the so the centre console now in the Volvos controls everything. Uh, including your, you know, your air conditioning, your heating, etc, etc. And the screen failed. Um, which causes you a problem because you can't basically can't do anything with the car except turn the radio up and down and turn on the demisters. That's about your lot, um, and that was a recurring issue uh, with the the early XC60. I think they've resolved it now. We've had no problems with the V60, but yeah, the early ones a little bit interesting, shall we say? But mini rant just interjecting there is manufacturers. There is nothing wrong with a little rotary dial to control the climate control. Rather than going in a touchscreen menu. Interestingly, stay tuned to a future episode of Automotive Tales where we have the exact same conversation about the <laughs> Vauxhall Insignia. Uh, yep. Because m me and John were out on a, a new series that, that is phenomenal, but only got one episode filmed before we uh, went locked down. And we went out in my car compared to John's, but uh, later in the day went out in John's. And I remember John saying, I'd like the fact you have little knobs to turn the heating up and down. Uh, I, I do like why, your knobs, Martin, why, yes. Why would you have anything else other than knobs? Like, you know, it, so I'm with Greg on that. So we've, I think we've all shared our views and we've concluded that the Skoda Kodiak is the ultimate family car. So the fact <laughs> group have won both so far. Okay. Uh, 4x4 utility. Martin, Go. Oh, uh, I actually haven't thought about this one. Um, in that, I think it. I, 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 do you want genuine four by four as in workhorse? Yes. So we kind of uh, SUVs kind of sits in both these categories. But I, I assumed <laughs> very incorrectly that we were going to head towards the kind of estate car as the family car option, um, and that that would leave kind of more roughly tufty SUVs. In, in this category but yeah the idea of this was something that is actually properly utilitarian so you know you, your farmer giles you know you want to be able to go into town but you also want to be able to you know tow trailers do farm stuff um drive up through the fields without getting stuck what do you take oh easy i suzu d max fair enough <laughs> there's a reason why in about it was about five years ago every company that you know, towed anything. So whether it be gardeners, uh, car, tra little car transporters, whatever, swapped from Nissan Navaras that was splitting in half to literally, literally to the twin turbo um, diesel uh, D Maxes, and we ran some at, at work. And you know, they were doing seventy thousand miles a year uh, with with zero issues, and had an unlimited uh, warranty. Th I think it was three year warranty on them. 
uh, unlimited mileage. Um, the, the cheapest ships to pick up used. Uh, our local farmer at the uh, Wicked Haven Fest ran one up until very recently. Um, so I think if you want a genuine towing car that can tow two tons, um, it's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be a nice place to sit, but it will do the job well. Very good. Uh, Chris, what are your thoughts? Uh, so assuming you can get one, uh, Suzuki Jimny. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm glad you brought that up because that was the number one option I had uh, and I was a little suspicious as to whether you can still get them so I did go and do some googling uh, yeah. and I'm afraid uh, the Jimny although it is on the Suzuki website uh, and they've got some lovely images and write up on it you can no longer buy it for sale in the UK except second hand unless there's any pre-registered ones there is one on also trader uh, remaining uh, a 1.5 SZ5 all grip for £25,991. They are cool, though. Yeah, although um, I'm not sure quite what the status is, but they were talking about bringing them back as a uh, commercial vehicle uh, and just whipping the seats out the back uh, to get around the... Um, I think it's an emissions-based... It is emissions, yeah. They've not stopped selling them because they've stopped producing them. They've stopped selling them because they can't import them to the UK anymore for emissions reasons. It's Yeah, it's something along those lines. Um, but when it comes back, uh, a Suzuki Jimny. Uh, yeah, they're, they're great little things. Um, they're, they're cool looking. Um, you know, they, they hark back to the old Suzuki 4x4s uh, of old. There's lots of cool little design cues that are in them. You know they're they're small. They're they're very capable as off-roaders. They still have live axles, um, which most stuff uh, has has uh, shot off. You know years ago now, um, but you know for that reason you can turn them into very capable uh, off-roaders. Um, and I, I've seen a few um, already now that have have been quite extremely modified for uh, Iceland and things like that running massive flotation tyres uh, people uh, in Japan doing rock crawling with them and all sorts of things and they are still very very capable and they are uh, you know they, they live up to the, the Jimny name Very good and do uh, you know what I, I think I totally agree the Jimny I desperately desperately wanted one when we replaced cars I was kind of going towards the other direction of with replacing an XC9 T as a big workhorse tow vehicle the you know we could take a Jimny into the fields and get it up to its eyeballs in mud and it would be absolutely fine but they were impossible to get hold of it would have had to be second hand we'd have paid way of the odds uh, and actually, in terms of being sizable inside, it probably wasn't as practical as the as the V60 is. Um, so unfortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, I had picked my alternative option was something Greg's already mentioned. Actually, I quite like the Dacia Duster for one simple reason: it is a Ron Seal vehicle. But I don't think, unlike the reference we made earlier to it being uh, characterless, a bit like an Almira, it's just a you know a very an car. I think actually quite a characterful little vehicles. Actually, I quite like the styling of the dusters. Aren't they? They're quite fun, and they they look like a proper little off roader rather than an SUV. Especially if you get them with the full four wheel drive kit, which I realised actually I did go and look this up. Uh, you can get a duster from just under twelve thousand pounds, but not actually a utilitarian four wheel drive one. For that, you've got to go up to the uh, I don't know what the trim levels called, but basically to get it in four by four trim, it starts at twenty thousand, give or take. So it's not that cheap, actually, because um, when you see twelve thousand pounds for a you know a little little four before, you think that's great, but it's not. It's two wheel drive, unless you spend the extra seven or eight thousand. So yeah, okay, uh, Greg, what about you? What are your thoughts on four by four slash utility vehicles? Uh, I think for me, it, I was probably going to agree with Martin up until very recently, and I, I borrowed one of the vehicles from uh, our MT yard that's started to replace some of the defenders we've got for sort of general day-to-day -day practicality. And it's the updated Hilux. Now I went off them a while ago. So about 10 years ago, we had one and I, I did an ammo room with one, one of the exercises. And they were notorious for stepping the back end out and being a bit flitzy on the back end if you had no weight in them. But having having been in, uh, seen a D-Max, I've been in the L200 Mitsubishi, I just think the, the Toyotas, it's a nicer ride. It's a more comfortable place to be. And it still tows three and a half ton 
or up to towing capacity of three and a half ton after the midlife update last year. So it's up there with its competitors. Uh, and I think just from personal experience, when I look at it, I think uh, Toyota with their last update has just managed to nudge edge. I've no doubt the next Isuzu or the next Mitsubishi, I think the due next year will probably again bring the playing field up. But I think in the current Toyota have just brought that bit of refinement. Uh, and going back to what we said, I think a couple of episodes ago, uh, it's a vehicle which you can stick your kids in at the weekend when you're doing your week's work and still use it at the weekend mm. and go out. And I think I think it was the episode we were talking about the uh, the Range Rover. I think we were on the rant about the Range Rover. Why would you buy a Range Rover when actually you could buy something like an, an L200, a D Max, a Hilux? Do your day's work, throw your sheep in the back, throw your bales in the back, and then at the weekend, hose it down, stick the family in it, and go to town shopping or tow the caravan is, somewhere. What the Range Rover used to be. Well, I mean, Hilux has a reputation for a reason, doesn't it? <laughs> There's a reason they called it the indestructible at one point. So sports cars, which is possibly the most interesting round. Who wants to kick us off on current crop of sports cars? Go on then. Um, and I'll, I'll start with the caveat is uh, I know it's not really a sports car, um, but it's, it's in that sort of category. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great start. Um, the Lexus LC. Um, I think it's a, a really, really nice looking car. Um, uh, purely for that alone, uh, I think it would be my choice. Uh, um, really, I don't have much more to add than that. It, it just. I'm, I'm going to have to goose it. Lexus LC. It is stunning. It's a stunning car. I followed, I followed one uh, back from work a few times, and the brake lights, even something as simple as the brake lights in it. Are just yeah. beautiful, and I would say that it is a sports car, but it's a GT. You know, it's a GT. Yeah, yeah, it's much more in that comfortable long distance cruiser that you could drive yeah. to the south of France or. It's or an SL competitor, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's it's not a, a not intended to be dynamic or um, you know particularly uh, sporty, I suppose. But it is. It well, is a five cruiser. liter V eight. It is a bit of a. It is a yeah. bit of a beast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, give you that. No, I think that definitely counts as a sports car because um, in that category, yeah, you do get things like the SL. You know, you get the GT cars. Mm. You know, a Bentley Continental GT is still a sports car, albeit it's kind of bordering on supercarish. Yeah. But yeah, cool. Okay, yeah, that's, that's a bit of a left field choice. I'd never really kind of thought of that as an option. Um, so go on, then, Martin. Well, go clockwise around the screen. Interestingly, uh, you've just said what I was going to go for because if you'd have asked me this question about five years ago I would have definitely picked an Aston Martin um, however I can't stand the new Aston Martins I don't think they're pretty I don't like I don't like their interiors I think Mercedes the Mercedes sort of interiors have made them completely overcomplicated and not as uh, beautiful as they should be um, Conversely, I believe that Bentley have done the complete opposite and made the Continental GT from being a very boring, uh, overused, sort of glitzy car into something that I genuinely think is rather stunning. Um, but is it a sport car Well, it, via Grand Tourer? Well, I would say that with using the same arguments as the LC, the fact it's got the V8 in it, the fact that it's... Yeah, the LC... The LC... The LC, if you look on its, its classification in the UK, is a sport car, not a Grand Tourer. Um, <laughs> I mean, I would say that uh, for this, um, my 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 view is that it's a sports car in that you have to be able to afford okay. the fuel, and it will be probably as fast as that LC. It's going to be a quick car, yeah. So. Not, not to 60 is four seconds, and it goes 198 miles an hour. To me, that's quite sporty. Um, so yeah. I, it's a bit of a goer. I, yeah, and I don't, I don't really see the appeal of um, sports cars in the sense of a Ferrari or anything like that. Uh, so I would have always picked a GT car in the same way I would have picked a Vanquish many years ago, and that's not a sports car in that same definition. It's a, it's a Grand Tourer. So uh, you okay. Know. Yeah. So, Captain, not so very fast. You're saying that Nürburgring times don't matter and a sports car should also be comfortable. Correct. It should be an enjoyable place to be. It should feel special. And it should also be... It should have a V. It should have a uh, V in the title. 
I want to mock you incredibly, but I actually don't necessarily disagree with that at all. Woohoo! Um, go on, Greg. You're dying to put us all uh, out of our misery. Uh, I'm not really, because I'm probably going to probably going to shoot myself in the foot in a second with my nomination. But uh, it's the first car that popped into my head when I fell through. I did actually think about the Bentley. I just thought it was a bit big to go in the definition of a sport car. But yeah, no, I can take your point. It's big, comfortable, fast. It's not exactly your sort of Bentley. That, that's your sort of Bentley, isn't it? Yeah, but it's a it's 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 a yeah. It's a it's a modern it's a modern day luxury pair of slippers going quickly uh, <laughs> over long distance. But anyway, so uh, I'd probably pick a Nissan GTR. I've got a bit of a thing for some of the the, the Japanese tech at the moment, and if I want yes. if I wanted to go have that sort of play, I think it would be a GTR. And I think uh, the GTR at the moment is a nice car. There's some there's some quite funky paint schemes, and I think I'm going to spend that sort of money. I want something that's just different i could put a randomly wacky color on it and did you did you just accuse us of picking grand tauras and then pick a car that literally yes, is that's, called that's, that's, yeah exactly exactly which is why i sat there and went i'm just about to shoot myself are we, are we going to change your name on twitter to the yorkshire hypocrite <laughs> <laughs> although i would i would say that probably you know if you were putting them side by side people will recognize the gtr as, as the sportiest of those three we've spoken about I think when you look at the, you know, you're looking at best part of uh, 540 brake horsepower, it's 600, uh, well, it depends how you get the tune, but I think it's up to 600 horsepower. It's nearly 500 pound foot of torque. It's 0 to 60 in two seconds. Well, I think it's just shy of two and a half. Even though it says GTR in the badge, I think... It's not exactly a slouch. I think that's a car you could go play on the track with Ferrari... Uh, Lamborghini, all that stuff. So, yeah, Grand Tour in the name, but I'd say it's closer to sports car then. So, so would we say that anything sort of over about five hundred horsepower is probably a sports car, like like you know maybe like the Lexus or the five hundred and forty two yes. brake horsepower Bentley Continental GT? <laughs> maybe, <laughs> yeah. but Chris, can you upgrade to the LFA, please? <laughs> or mm, is it an upgrade? <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's a bit older, isn't it? But uh, yeah. in fact, do they still make them? They must have stopped by now. No, they stopped. They stopped. They stopped many years ago. Yeah, yeah. 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 But I think, think that was the start of that styling queue, wasn't it? That yeah. You see on the LC. Yeah. To, to be honest, uh, I, I was um, going to make this point on the uh, GTR because I assumed that they would have gone out of production by now. But um, I saw one quite recently that was a brand new on a. Um, on a you know it was six months old on on the from the number plate and I was quite surprised um, mm. and I remember thinking at the time oh they they still actually make these because I'm not sure when they uh, first came out the GTR they are getting quite long in the tooth aren't they? they've got to yeah. be pushing yeah, ten years now I'll tell you what as well actually um, they're they're over ten years I think it was fifth. 59, 09, 59 that they brought mm. them out. But wow. I've, I've just had a quick look because you're right. I remember if anyone's familiar with Nottingham, um, they've got a massive uh, Nissan dealer there that's got a four story showroom, mm. a little tower um, just outside the city centre. And there was always a GTR there. So I've just done exactly the same thing, had a look, um, and there is indeed a Nissan GTR brand new in stock, 3.8, 570 PS auto. The thing that surprised me. They're only 83k. Yeah, they're 83 grand mm. recommended. So I think the problem is though they've they've moved into a market where the Exotica has got more expensive and where you know 15 20 years ago you'd have paid 80 90 grand for a Ferrari, Lamborghini, Aston Martin. They've gone sort of north into six figures now whereas you could still get that performance. Oh, well and, truly. Uh, and the guy at work is interested this guy at work who's got an LC. And it's in a stunning blue and it's a beautiful car, and I do agree. But I love it in that colour, which is a, for anybody who's listening, it's a, again, it's a very lovely electric blue and it just looks, it still looks a good car for its age. It's a lot of car for the money. It's a hell of a lot of car for the money, and I don't think I appreciated that. Um, okay, well, that actually interestingly brings brings you all the way around to my choice, which is actually a sports car. Um, so I'm afraid I'm going to. It's not a Volvo? <laughs> no. Uh, in terms of sports cars, I started kind of thinking Supra and this is the associated Z4. And I'll be honest, I actually really don't like it. I just, there's something about the Supra styling. I just, 
it doesn't do it for me. The Z4, yeah, not so bad, um, but maybe less of a sports car. It's more of a kind of top-down cruiser. Um, one of the obvious choices was 911, and don't get me wrong, I do love the new 911, um, but I probably I just I think they're they're just the Alpha well, ones are just a bit mad. The GT3 RS, for example, is just bonkers. I do quite like the 911 Touring that they do, which has got a lot of the performance of the GT3, but has got less of the big wings and all the fancy stuff. It looks a bit more subtle. So you don't look like you're trying to be a boy racer before you get started, but you've got the performance and handling and all the kit that goes with it. Um, But I thought if it came down to it and I wanted an actual sports car, is that what I would buy? And the answer is probably no. I think the thing I've settled on is a French car. Uh, it is. It starts at forty-seven thousand pounds, so significantly cheaper than all those others. So it's an Alp. It's an Alpine. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's a Renault Alpine, mm. an A one hundred and ten. Renault Alpine, A one hundred and ten. Yeah. So yeah, anywhere between forty-seven and fifty-six. So it's actually not that expensive a car, and what you get is a bespoke, I think they're basically hand-built sports cars by. You know, Alpine, which is, I think, going to be the name for the Renault F1 team next year. So they they obviously planning on doing more with the brand. Um, but I think the A110 has really kind of hit the nail on the head. I think it's a great, a great looking thing as well. And you can definitely see the design cues from the original uh, Alpines. It's, uh, it's a cool little thing. And I'm told drives very, very well when they're not on fire. Obviously, they're uh, 1.8 litre, um, 250 brake is that that's sort of an area that's been missing for quite a while um in the Absolutely. is this sort of like the the modern day interpretation of an elise yeah i think you're probably not far wrong there actually because you know even you look at the the entry level porsches you look at the boxsters and the and the cayman you know they're they're coming in much much higher up certainly price wise they're coming in you know 60 80000 with significantly more power in the sort of 300 plus brake horsepower and actually then you've got there's not a lot in that middle region there's the kind of the mx5 which is you know slightly cheaper slightly less powerful but is a you know more of a driver's car the z4 the super um you know more expensive and more powerful and so i think yeah it's kind of in a, a league of its own that was yeah you say lotus lotus elise lotus land sort of territory it's just almost forgotten about. Can I um, can I show you how how petty I am about these kind of things, but with just one very simple statement, um, which is this: I'm now currently looking at an Alpine uh, on here. Um, you can see some parts that are shared with other manufacturers, and that's fine. And then I saw the stalk that they fitted. For the the Clio or something, isn't it? Yeah, they fitted the stalk for the 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 volume, um, which is oh. the same volume <laughs> stalk that has been on Renaults for twenty years. We have an 06 Clio Sport, <laughs> which has the same volume controls. But yeah. as I'm a massive fan of the uh, the Clio 172, um, I'm going to go with that. Doesn't really bother me. I just feel that if you're buying something, it has to be special, um, mm. and and I am so it's a, it, I'm so <laughs> anal about those terrible. Oh, you know. <clears throat> Hold on, sorry, Martin. This is coming from somebody who said they liked the previous generations of Aston Martin that had, well, certainly the older generation, significant amount of Ford parts and Volvo, and then they had Volvo, yeah, Volvo sat nav straight yeah. out of the XC90 in the dashboard. Yes, but what you've got to remember there is that Aston. Uh, then fitted, I suppose you know uh, other parts that were special enough to outdo them, like the dials, the gear selector along the top. I just think if you were if you were Renault, why would you not just say, right, guys, you know that we've used this stalk for a while. Maybe we should you know put a bit of chrome on it or something to make it a little bit different. Um, it it makes me sad. Speaking of next round, um, we we are currently an hour and thirty five minutes into an hour long podcast. Um, <laughs> what? I'm going to have to be quite brutal when it comes to editing this. <laughs> um, okay, so next round then: uh, battery electric vehicles and or hybrids. Um, so I'm going to start. So I've kind of already given the game away. Um, in as I much think. as I have uh, lost my interest in 
uh, in BMWs as a general brand. Uh, I do think a few years ago they had this little bit of inspiration that was just out of this world, which was the i3 and the i8. Uh, and they still sell them because they were clearly good enough to hang on for long enough. Um, and for me, if I had to choose a battery electric vehicle, obviously I'd love an i8, wonderful machine, but it's never really going to happen. So my choice would be the i3 because I just think it's cool as... Uh, still is, even though it's, I mean, it's what, a seven, eight-year-old design now? Um, and, yeah, they're a little bit expensive. They're coming at about 50 grand. Um, oh, sorry, actually, no, I'm reading my notes from a distance. So you can get them from 39,000, but I did play on the website and add all of the options up, and it will cost you just over 50,000 for an i3 if you add all the options on. Um, but, yeah, I just I just think they're, they're cool. Uh, and I'm going to give an honorary mention to... Uh, the VW Up because I love the fact they called it an E Up <laughs> as a Yorkshireman. I kind of feel that it appeals to me as a Yorkshireman. Okay, who wants who wants to go next? What about? Um, all right, go on then, Chris. So um, for me, I think the choice would have to be, although it does have its uh, various pitfalls, the the Jaguar uh, I Pace is actually a very very good car. Um, I had the opportunity to drive one uh, probably about eight or nine months ago now, and um, it kind of does everything to a, to a good level. It's it's very comfortable. Um, the interior feels well screwed together. It's um, you know something that has quite a bit of poke. Uh, it's it's quite fast, um, way more there than you would ever need. Um, I I don't think it looks too bad. Uh, I think it's okay on that front. It's nice that they've not gone fully down the route of oh it's an electric vehicle therefore it has to look a bit weird just because yeah. um you know a lot of companies doing that and oh it's an electric vehicle therefore it must look futuristic or blah blah blah. Um and um yeah i i think that would be a solid choice and it's something that you could quite happily use every day for your commute um but also you can take the family away in it it's not um you know ridiculously impractical um and um yeah yeah i think it, it i know that it has a, a you know a few issues but um it i think it's i'm right in saying it's jlr's first effort in the in the bev zone and uh yeah i I quite like it overall, I think. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to argue with that. Um, I certainly think it's a good car. I've heard a lot of good things about it from those people I know that have uh, have owned one or do still own one. So yeah, I mean that's a it's a yeah fair enough. Uh, Greg, what about you then? Have you have you decided? The, I've I've got a fundamental problem with Bev's. I think we're chasing the wrong power source personally uh i don't think it's the right way to go so i've got a little bit of controversy in there particularly when i look at where i think we maybe need to be looking at hydrogen or ammonia as an alternative particularly ammonia in fuel cells because it's uh, something that could apply to aviation as well as cars uh, and i have a significant issue with nobody ever seems to want to address the elephant in the room of uh, lithium and how we get lithium out of the ground and the damage that does around the world so that's that's my little rant in there but if I was to look at it for what they work I do agree that they are a fantastic solution for those who go in and out of town I see a lot of people who do them short journeys mm -hmm. so for me I actually think Renault hit the nail on the head and I still think if you want like the ZE50 Zoe which will do nearly 300 miles in the real world it's got a reasonable size boot. They're generally well specced. I wouldn't say it's the most comfortable, but actually the, the latest, the, the updated version looks quite smart. They've kept it quite good looking. Uh, it's had a much needed interior update. And I think you can pick them up starting around the 20 grand mark, uh, 20 to 25 grand new. So they're fairly reasonably priced for doing that sort of short journey type stuff, dotting around. I'd probably pick the Zoe. Okay. So Greg's going to take Zoe. It's an interesting turn of events. Uh, Martin, what about you? So I understood this category as you said it as electric or hybrid. Uh, so I'm going to present to you three scenarios here. Um, 
the first one, very simple to get on, is that if we're going full electric, I completely agree with Greg. Um, pure, but for the very simple reason that I am in a position right now where, in an ideal world, we will get rid of one of our petrol cars and replace it with an electric car because we are now one of well, one of us is permanently working from home. Therefore, range anxiety is no longer a thing. Um, um haven't you haven't you just replaced one of your cars, Martin? Uh, we don't talk about that until a future episode of Automotive Tales, the <laughs> leading automotive podcast and YouTube channel. Um, and that, that, that I definitely think will have some range anxiety, but more on a re- reliability-based issue. Um, the, but the, the main reason why I picked the Zoe, and then I'll end this one here, is that we've now been having this exact same issue. And for me, it's about replacing the monthly cost and the only affordable electric car at the moment is a Zoe on some kind of lease or PCP. Even a Vauxhall Corsa, an electric Corsa, is £28,000, and it is still a Corsa. But, so Greg, Greg's hit the nail on the head of the Zoe, because in the real world, that is the right electric car. However, um, if I was to buy one for me personally... I still do too many miles for electric to be suitable, and I'm not a big enough fan of motorway services to have to stop. Um, and particularly my the sort of driving I do doesn't necessarily allow me to stop unless I want to delay coming home. And sometimes, you know, sometimes that would add an hour on to a already very long day. But the fundamental the fundamental problem there is infrastructure, though, isn't it? Really, that stops you doing that, and that's. It, 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 it is, but like, yeah, I, I think uh, eventually that will change. So for now, I would, you know, I have to wait for the technology to get a little bit better because sometimes my days could be 350 miles. And if that's in the winter, then I've got a problem. So I need the technology to improve and I need the infrastructure to improve. So my ideal, if, if I could have a dream hybrid car at the moment, new, then I will go against all of the things I said about SUVs previously and buy a ds7 because i think they are genuinely really pretty cars to be in i have been in one i've, I've driven one um a friend of mine got one as a company car as a hybrid and i just think they're actually really interesting a take on you know they are they i'm sure they're style over substance underneath but hmm. um, i just like them if we're allowed a used hybrid then i will please take a mclaren p1 <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh We've summarised. We all have quite a different take on that. I think. Um, so yeah, there's no no real conclusions on this category or the previous category. Um, but what that does bring us to is the end of this round, which means we're on to where we would normally have barge bingo. However, this time we we haven't asked you all to uh, to pick out another set of cheap cars, random cars, whatever it might be, from uh, eBay, Auto Trader, or a another uh, car sale website. We today are going to talk about who has won. So we've done four rounds of Barge Bingo. They have gone out on social media for people to vote on. Uh, We have had literally some votes. It's rigged. It's rigged. (laughs) And we have have counted up those votes uh, and then recounted them. Uh, and there's been some uh, some suing and uh, some court cases, and then we've recounted again, um, and now we've come up with the conclusion we started with as to who the winner is. So I'm not conceding, John. So the, the winner we're of... All winners. We're all, we're all we are winners. winners. We are all winners. <laughs> so the winner of season one's Barge Bingo is... Drumroll, please. Martin, congratulations. You have won season one's Barge Bingo. I'm so excited. Uh, this doesn't mean I have to go and buy all the things that I nominated, right? Uh, yes, it does. Right. So you have you have our our support and recommendation to do that. Which will mean absolutely nothing when you try and tell your your better half that you are going off to buy four cars. God, imagine what an idiot I would have been if I'd have nominated a London taxi. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd buy a London taxi? Seriously? Oh dear, tune in for a future episode of Automotive Tales. Uh, I'm genuinely thrilled to have won the barge bingo. I can't wait for series two. You know me and Chris, you know me and Chris are going to have to wander off and buy something random as well. Yes. Uh, well, John, I think that is a fantastic place to wrap everything up. Uh, congratulations to our winner of Barge Bingo there. Um, I've enjoyed season one. Have you? Mm. I have, yeah. It's been great fun. 
Brilliant. Thoroughly enjoyed, yes. Looking forward to the next ones. Brilliant. And, of course, thank you. If you you have us back. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you have to go through a 37-stage interview process that involves you buying all the cars that uh, you've nominated in Barge Bingo. Uh, (laughs) But, John, I think it just leaves us to say thank you to Chris, thank you to Greg. Uh, Thank you to you, John, for being ever-present at the Automotive Tales HQ there. So, uh, it's goodbye from me. Bye! That's a goodbye from them. Uh, It's goodbye from uh, Automotive Tales. Nice to see you. Ta-ra!